Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, the show where we examine the cells in our body as if they're the real VIPs we never knew we had. I'm Ethan Foster, your reliably subdued commentator, here to analyze the fine print of human health. And I'm Alara Skye, your resident comedic spark, who can't resist shining a bright light on fascinating health topics. I like to think of myself as the satirist who also happens to know her way around a mitochondrion. Ethan, do you think that's too niche? Only if you limit your comedic audiences to folks who do crossword puzzles using the periodic table. But that's exactly who we want listening, right? Exactly. So to those of you out there who can spell deoxyribonucleic without blinking, welcome. And to everyone else, we're still thrilled to have you on board. Today we're zooming in on a topic that might surprise a lot of people, the link between hearing impairment and Parkinson's disease risk. This might sound like a medical odd couple, but apparently they've been showing up at the same parties. Let's dive in. Let's indeed. I have to say, I never expected hearing issues to be potential early warning signs for a neurodegenerative disorder. That's like discovering your squeaky door hinge is an indicator your roof is about to leak. It's an odd connection, but apparently very real. You're not the first person to underestimate the significance of a squeaky hinge. It can also drive you crazy if you have to listen to it every time someone goes out for snacks. But in this case, the squeak is that mild hearing impairment could raise your risk for Parkinson's disease. And we're not talking about severe hearing loss. Even a slight decrease in your ability to comprehend speech in a noisy environment might increase your risk. That's right. If you find yourself struggling in crowded restaurants, it may not just be the lively chatter about sports teams or romantic escapades. You might want to pay attention to what your ears are telling you. A study from the UK Biobank showed a 57% spike in Parkinson's risk for every 10 decibel drop in hearing. Those numbers definitely get my attention. And I'm not even sure my hearing is that sharp to begin with. I think the real question is, how do you figure out if you're 10 decibels worse off than last week? I imagine it's not the kind of thing you solve by pressing your ear against a speaker blasting heavy metal and waiting to see if you feel dizzy. Probably not recommended. The key detail is that hearing impairment might be an independent risk factor for Parkinson's, meaning there's something intrinsically shared between your ears and your brain's motor function. Or your ears are just overachievers. They like to be included in every disease process possible. We see that as well when it comes to hearing impairment and dementia. Turns out hearing loss can double or even triple the risk of dementia. And you know us. If there's a worrisome statistic, we're going to make sure everyone hears about it, even if their ears are somewhat impaired. The common cause hypothesis suggests that hearing loss and dementia might be driven by the same underlying conditions, things like mitochondrial dysfunction or changes in certain proteins. Actually, the mitochondria might be the real unsung heroes, or maybe the villains, because if they start misfiring, you've got trouble in paradise. When mitochondria go down, your cells throw a party that you really don't want to attend. The refreshments are dysfunctional proteins, and the house band is a group of stressed-out neurons banging on the wrong instruments. Not a fun bash. I prefer a quiet weekend. Let's talk specifics. A study in Parkinsonism and related disorders reviewed data from a large group, 159,395 individuals, to be exact, over more than 14 years. They used a speech and noise test to gauge hearing, the outcome, a big link between poor hearing and Parkinson's. Which makes sense when you consider that early, non-motor signs of Parkinson's, like mild cognitive shifts or sensory changes, often show up well before the classic tremors. If you spot these signs early, you might have a better shot at intervention. It's intriguing that hearing tests aren't always standard in medical evaluations for Parkinson's. In fairness, I'm not sure most of us want an entire battery of tests, but it's tough if your doctor doesn't connect the dots between your hearing struggles and potential neurodegenerative issues. Certainly. Another study from Biomed Research International in 2017 looked at 35 Parkinson's patients and 35 healthy individuals and found that Parkinson's folks had more trouble discerning speech, particularly with background noise. It's like trying to read fine print on a shaky train while someone flickers the overhead light on and off. A rocky scenario indeed. The same group also had trouble with central auditory processing. That means it's not just the ear's physical mechanism, but the brain's ability to interpret sounds. Apparently, that can lead to a situation where you hear someone talking, but can't exactly decode what they're saying. Sort of like me attempting to parse modern slang from my nephews. They're talking, I know that much, but it all sounds like scrambled code. Meanwhile, people with Parkinson's might find it equally baffling to hear that code even if it's just regular speech. Let's add another twist. Hearing loss plus dementia plus Parkinson's disease severity. A 2024 study in Medicina analyzed this trifecta and factored in the infamous APOE genotype commonly associated with Alzheimer's risk. The results weren't exactly comforting. They found that individuals with hearing loss were more likely to have dementia and more severe Parkinson's. And if that wasn't enough, the APOE Epsilon 4 allele can spell more trouble. It ups the chance of cognitive decline. The study participants who carried that allele had a higher prevalence of dementia. It's one more reason to pay close attention to hearing, especially if you already have a family history of any neurodegenerative conditions. 
But it's not all doom and gloom. Let's talk about solutions, or at least strong suggestions. The unifying theme seems to be mitochondrial health. If your mitochondria are the powerhouses of your cells, consider them the tiny, hard-working employees who keep the lights on. We want them well-fed, well-rested, and stress-free. And definitely not paid in worthless cell currency. So how do we keep them happy? First, avoid processed foods, especially the seed oils lurking in everything from salad dressings to your beloved bag of chips. Ingredients like corn oil, soybean oil, canola oil, and safflower oil may taste innocent enough, but they can contain damaging levels of linoleic acid, also known as LA. LA, ironically, might not be about red carpets and sunshine. It's about interfering with mitochondrial function. Think of it like handing your mitochondria a crooked tool they can't use properly. If you want to be nice to these microscopic employees, give them healthier fats, skip the suspicious oils, and try cooking with butter or tallow if you tolerate those. Second, remember that carbs aren't the enemy. The trick is choosing the right ones. Fruits, some well-cooked rice, or other easily digestible sources that won't irritate a sensitive gut. A severely low-carb diet can strain mitochondria if your energy supply dips too low. It's not always beneficial to starve them unless you're planning something very specific like ketosis, which can be a different scenario. Yes, that scenario is typically accompanied by heightened awareness that you can't snack on that slice of pie. Meanwhile, the third step involves minimizing exposure to toxins, endocrine disruptors, plastics, excess estrogen, electromagnetic fields. They all put a serious burden on the body. It's like turning up the heat in an already sweltering office, then asking your mitochondria to work overtime. They can only handle so much before they walk out, or in this case, start malfunctioning. You can reduce exposure by switching to natural cleaning products using glass instead of plastic containers, and maybe not sleeping with your phone glued to your head. We love technology, but not so close that it confuses our cellular processes. There's also the matter of sun exposure. According to these insights, daily sunlight can be a boon to mitochondrial function, largely because of melatonin production. But if your body is still harboring large amounts of linoleic acid, it's recommended to be a little cautious. Maybe avoid direct midday sun if your diet has been heavy in seed oils. The point is to soak in some rays at a sensible level, not to fry yourself. Finally, we can talk about NAD plus boosting through something like niacinamide. NAD plus basically helps your mitochondria remain functional by providing the spark plugs they need. I'm paraphrasing, but the main idea is that more NAD plus means your cells are better at performing chores like cell repair, healthy cell death, and immune functions. It's the tidy house effect. Everything works more smoothly when you have the right ingredients. So basically, we can help stave off unwanted degenerative issues by focusing on the teeny tiny caretakers within our cells because apparently the best offense might just be a robust set of mitochondria. Correct. They're the personal trainers for our cells. And it all loops back to hearing health. If hearing impairment can be an early clue, we should pay attention to our ears, not just for waxing poetic, but for noticing subtle changes that might mean bigger issues down the line. Now, Elara, if you had to pick which piece of advice to adopt immediately, which would it be? I would definitely focus on removing those sneaky seed oils from my life. They're sort of like gate crashers at a party. You invite them in, and they make an unholy mess. Ditch them, and your mitochondria breathe a sigh of relief. That's a straightforward starting point. What about you, Ethan? I'd probably pick the toxin-reducing route. Not that I'm living in a plastic bubble, but every day you can reduce a bit of exposure is one more day you don't push your cells into revolt. And by revolt, I mean the subtle, destructive processes that can accumulate over time. Now, as we wrap up, let's give folks a quick summary. Hearing impairment is not just about missing the punchline in a crowded room, though that's unfortunate especially if I'm the one telling the joke. It could be an early flag for Parkinson's disease and might also tie into higher dementia risks. And the common denominators for all these conditions might be the underlying cellular mechanics, specifically the mitochondria, and certain proteins that, when they go haywire, start a domino effect. If that effect includes hearing loss, it's worth paying attention to. Plus, adopting a more mindful diet, cutting processed foods, ditching questionable oils, and balancing your carbs helps maintain strong cellular energy reducing your toxic burden, exposing yourself to sun sensibly, and boosting NAD plus all build on that foundation. Simple, practical steps that collectively bolster our brain and hearing. So the next time you're in a busy restaurant and you can't make out half the conversation, don't just nod along like you understand your friend's new phone plan or their favorite brand of sneakers. Check in with yourself and see if it's a pattern worth exploring. Yes, feigning interest in phone plans is an art form, but hearing your buddy rave about their latest phone's battery life is part of being a good friend. If you suspect hearing trouble, investigate. It just might save you from bigger issues. We hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the surprising connection between hearing impairment and Parkinson's disease. If you've learned something new, like that your mitochondria are basically the underappreciated logistics department, then today's episode was a success. So, ends another intriguing exploration on Dr. Mercola's cellular wisdom. We covered the ear, the brain, the powerhouses in each cell, and why ignoring subtle signs might lead to bigger concerns. 
Keep the conversation going. And remember, your cells might be small, but they're extremely chatty in the grand scheme of health. Listen closely to them, especially if they're whispering about your hearing. That whisper could be the key to a big g ear puzzle. I'm Ethan Foster, ever the observer of the everyday details, signing off for now. And I'm Alara Sky, reminding you to maintain a sense of humor, keep those mitochondria happy, and maybe say goodbye to the sketchy oils lurking in your pantry. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe now and click the notification bell so you never miss an update. See you in the next video.